So even those who have not survived in the physical sense, their stories do survive, largely through forensic anthropology. So we'll take a look at, uh, first of all, how bone formation is formed, looking at male versus female skull and skeletal remains, and um, how our bones can tell a story of what happened throughout our lives. We can also approximate age, the um, difference among races with facial structure, and uh, the role of mitochondrial DNA in postmortem identification. Here are a couple of terms, anthropology, physical anthropology, forensic anthropology. Take a look at those. So the historical development, in the 1800s, scientists began studying skulls. And in 1897, there was an interesting case in Europe in which a sausage maker decided he didn't want his wife around anymore. So naturally, he killed her, boiled her body, and then attempted to um, dispose of it, of the remains, through the sausage making factory machinery. However, um, there were bits of her finger, her skull, and her arm left over in the form of bone tissue. In 1932, FBI opens the first crime lab, and Smithsonian Institution partners with the FBI, which brings in bones inherently. All right, so. Um, Continuing on, 1939, a guy named William Krogman, who you see pictured here, uh, wrote a guide to skeletal ID, and uh, he's seen here holding a human calvarium, which is a skull which, in which the eye socket portion has broken off. World War II, there were soldiers killed and identified through anthropological means. And 1981, big breakthrough when Dr. Bill Bass um, at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, uh, created the body farm. It was the first body farm to exist. There are now a couple of more. It's um, very close to the UT Knoxville campus. And a person could conceivably, and people do, donate their bodies to um, science for the purpose of researching how the body uh, decays and, and then how the bone structure is left in different variables. And then in, in 1984, the DNA technology came about and, um, and in those following years was used in forensic analysis and, um, and also with skeletons. So characteristics of bones, big misnomer is that bones are unliving tissue. On the contrary, they are alive. In fact, the marrow within the bone is uh, responsible for creating blood cells and the deposition or depositing of calcium um, and other minerals to the bones is regulated by our hormones. So, a couple of important types of cells. Osteoblast cells, I think of um, B, like beginning. Osteoblast cells are where bones originate. And um, ossification is the process of turning cartilage into bone, which is what happens when a person grows. Uh, the life cycle of a bone is that it is deposited. Minerals such as calcium are deposited. Um, and then it breaks down over time or with the help of osteoclasts, and then it, the bone tissue is replaced. Osteoclasts are another type of bone cell which are actually used to break down bones rather than build them like the osteoblast cells. Now specifically osteoclasts are um, allowing bones to reshape as those bones grow, um, and they balance calcium levels, remove cellular waste from uh, bones, and um, then another uh, important thing with bone development is, the, is osteoporosis, which is a defi deficiency in calcium, where you go from having a, a nice, healthy, spongy um, bone tissue to something like this, which is void of the calcium that it needs. Now, we need to talk about different tissues that allow bones to function. Uh, cartilage is one. And as you see here, there is a cartilage in your knee in the form of the articular cartilage, which is um, attached to the bottom part of your femur, and um, also the media meniscus cartilage and lateral meniscus cartilage, which is attached to the top of your tibia. And this helps for shock absorption, preventing of scraping of bone to bone. Another tissue that's important are ligaments, and these connect two or more bones together. So possibly the most famous ligament in the body due to the propensity for injury is the ACL or anterior cruciate ligament. That's the one that you see here. There's also an LCL and an MCL. And this is a right knee. So you see the tibia here, the fibula would be on the outside. 
Another type of tissue allowing bones to function are tendons. And a tendon is connecting muscle to bone. I always remember that um, because an Achilles tendon connects your gastrocnemius or calf muscle to your heel bone. And um, I've also got Achilles represented here in the form of Brad Pitt. The way the bone ages is that um, under 30 years, they're increasing in size. Over 30, unfortunately, the process reverses. However, there is something you can do about it. As this lady is demonstrating, she is my inspiration. Exercise is one thing that can slow the deterioration of bone, which is really pretty cool. Okay. So an osteobiography is um, basically a story that the bones can tell us about some pretty um, specific details of that person's life. This includes their gender, their age, their height, their general health, um, but additionally you can even tell some details like which hand was more dominant. If the muscles of that dominant hand were, um, were stronger, then they oftentimes um, stimulate more bone development to be able to hold those um, more developed muscles. So you, if a person's right-handed, you might have um, slightly larger right, right arm bones. And then also you can use x-rays to identify any kind of medical additions to uh, the skeletal structure. Okay, let's look at the difference between males and females first using the skull. So in general, the male skull is more squared, and that includes not only the skull itself, but also the eye orbits. You can see are more squared than the more rounded female over here to the right. The mandible is also more square, whereas the females is more rounded, and the upper brow ridge up here is more developed in the male than the female. Continuing on, the occipital protuberance, which is at the back of the skull, is present in the male, absent in the female. Frontal bone, which is the forehead, is more sloping in the male uh, than the female. The uh, surface is more rough and bumpy with the male than the female. And um, the ramus of the mandible, which is what you see right here, this section of the mandible, is straighter in the male, more slanting in the female. Lastly, the nuchal crest, which, um, so what we're looking at here is, this is the foramen magnum, where your spinal cord um, comes through and attaches into your brain. Uh, so this is the base, back side of the skull. That nuchal crest, also known as a nuchal line, is rough and bumpy in the male, smooth in the female. So I'm going to ask you a couple of quiz questions here, and let's see how you do. All right, I'd like you to go ahead and take a look at these, think about them, and have an answer in mind. Pause your video now. So in taking a look at the answers uh, for each of these questions, the female skull is smoother um, than the male, so this is true. The frontal bone is more sloping in the male, right here as you see that um, differing angle. Male eye, eye orbits are not more circular, they are more square, and the male jaw is more square with a with an angle closer to 90 degrees, as you see here. So, hopefully you've come to the conclusion that the one on the left is a female, one on the right is a male. If you have a pelvis, then you should use it to try to um, determine the sex of the individual. And so, um, here on the left, we see the um, a wider subpubic angle. Here on the right, we see a more acute angle. And so, which one do you think is which? Well, Guess what? Females are in charge of childbirth. And so um, the wider the subpubic angle, the better that experience will go. And so um, you have uh, the female pelvis, which is characterized by a wider subpubic angle and oftentimes a wider girth in these bones up here with the pelvis and also shorter, whereas the male subpubic angle, less than 90 degrees and just a taller pelvis in general. Another difference is with the femur. In addition to the male femur being thicker, there's also a differing angle. Um, notice that the attachment of the femur here to the pelvis and then here to the lower leg and the tibia um, is more of a, a vertical uh, straight line, whereas the female it bends inward. And this is responsible for an increased number of ACL tears among females than males. One of my uh, best friends, Stephanie, right here to my right, this, is, this picture was taken um, on my wedding day, 
Stephanie was a great basketball player, and um, she had a commitment to play at a really, um, really great SEC school. And unfortunately, that was not honored because her senior year of high school, she tore an ACL. Well, she goes on to play at a little bit of a smaller school, tears her other ACL. She rehabs, you know, this is her second one, and then she tears the first one again. So three ACL tears, and part of the reason may be attributed to the fact that her uh, femur angle was not as straight as what a male's might be. Let's talk about skull development throughout your life. One thing that strikes me about these numbers is how high they are. So it's really uh, later into adulthood that some of the skull changes finalize. Everybody has sutures, and as a baby, you have really big gaps between the sutures, which lead to soft spots mm -hmm. with babies. But um, by age 30, the suture at the back of the skull closes. Age 32, the one across the top closes. And by age 50, the suture running uh, side to side, the coronal suture, will close. Now, at birth, babies have a very different skeletal system than they will into adulthood. Uh, babies are born with 450 or more bones, whereas an adult has 206. So what happens is those bones will fuse together, kind of like what you saw in the skull. Um, now, there is an epiphysis line that is present. Um, any place where cartilage is being replaced by bone, uh, by the osteoblasts. And so when the cartilage is fully replaced, you no longer see the line. So this is basically what the doctor's talking about when you go and he says, yep, your growth plates have closed up, you're done growing. Uh, he's looking at those lines of epiphysis that have gone to the end of where, uh, of where the bone is. So um, as we talked about earlier, there are a lot of numbers here uh, where you see that bone changes happen at a pretty developed age. Um, Based on your age, 17, 18, uh, you still have a lot of changes that will happen to your skeletal system. Let's pick a couple. Um, you can look at uh, down here, anytime really around the, the time of puberty, ranging from 14 to 21, there are some fus fusions uh, of bone that happen um, in these bones here. So once again here, you can see um, that the, there are multiple bones that are going to continue changing um, even after you graduate high school. All right, let's take a look at height estimation. We're going to go over um, some more detail with this as we crunch numbers based on some formulas that have been created uh, to estimate height based on things like sex and ethnicity. And this is based on research largely that was done at the body farm. So uh, we want long bones. We want one of six. You can use the radius. You can use the ulna. You can use the femur, the tibia, which is your shin bone, the fibula, which is just outside of that, and um, also the humerus, which is this bone here. So six long bones that we can use to estimate height. If you have a choice, pick the femur. It's the best one. So um, in being able to distinguish uh, ethnicity, we can look at shape of eye sockets, presence of a nasal spine. We'll talk more about this in our lab. Um, prognathism is something characteristic of a member of negroid. So we break it down into three, negroid, caucasoid, and mongoloid uh, for purposes of forensic anthropology. Prognathism is something more characteristic of uh, negroid. Um, and there are some other characteristics we'll go over a little bit more. Facial reconstruction is something that can happen either with computer models or with old-fashioned clay. So you can take a skull and build layers of tissue around that skull to try to emulate what that person may have looked like during life. DNA evidence is um, something that, again, emerged in the 1980s. However, bone is largely void of nuclear DNA, uh, though it does often have mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited straight from the mother. So maternal lineage is recorded in DNA evidence. For that reason, mitochondrial DNA is technically a form of class evidence, um, but it can definitely do wonders in narrowing down identification. All right, we could also look at ske skeletal trauma. So anything like this that may have happened during life uh, to that victim. All right, so here's a summary of what we visited today, and I'll say thanks for joining in.